All right, Tanya, we are now live and we're getting some participants beginning to come in. A good afternoon, those of you who are joining from the East Coast of the United States. Good morning, those on Pacific time. Good morning from me. This is Scott Anthony. I am based in Singapore and it is a, a sad and scary time of one in the morning. Tanya, where are you right now? Hi, um, Scott and, and everyone else. I'm actually on the East Coast of the United States uh, in uh, New York City. So it is it is still it is actually one minute past midday so good afternoon and if there's anyone in europe good i guess good good evening uh, and uh you know we we, we are going to try and make tanya and i are going to try and make this discussion interactive we, we'll get into it in about 90 seconds or so we'll just give some time for people to join but it, it, we are thrilled to take your questions you can use the q a function on zoom to throw questions at us We'd love to hear some voices during the discussion too. So if you want to go into the chat window and send something to the panelists so Tanya and I can see it, that's great. You know, maybe you can even do something simple. Just let us know where you're zooming in from today. We'd love to know what geographies are represented on this Thursday, November the 6th. Now, Friday, uh, it's the 5th. It's the 5th. It is Friday, November the 6th in Singapore. And I've got a question here that about whether the previous sessions will be available on the web. Yes, we are recording these sessions. They will be posted to eatsleepinnovate.com. We haven't quite processed the one from last week yet, but they'll be posted soon. And I see we've got uh, somebody else from New York. We've got someone from Denmark who has called in. Good afternoon, Henrik. Thank you for joining. And Deborah from New York, that's great to see. Yeah, fantastic. Actually, Copenhagen is the uh, heart of our product innovation team. So hello, Denmark. We've got a Dubai, we've got an India. India, I feel your pain. It's not quite as late in India as it is here. We've got uh, 1030 in the evening in India. But uh, you know, that, that's still reasonably late at night to be hearing about innovation. It's good. Never too late, never too early. We've got Ottawa. So we've got um, a Ann Arbor, Michigan. Michigan, a state that many people are paying extra close attention to for whatever reason. We're not going to talk about the election here, I promise. That's going to be the only, <laughs> only uh, election reference that we're going to make. We've got a, uh, we've got a Manhattan here too. Uh, we've got uh, friends, <laughs> friends from the Philippines here, as always. All right, great. I, I think we're going to get into the matter at hand. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Those of you who joined the first version of the Eat, Sleep, Innovate Virtual Book Club know the drill. This is gonna go for about 45 minutes. It'll go to 1245 East Coast time. I'm gonna run as MC. I'm Scott Anthony, the lead author of our recently released book, Eat, Sleep, Innovate. I've got a set of questions I'm going to ask Tanya, and I would love to have that be a starting point. If you have specific questions you want to ask, and we've got people from Prague and the UK and Mexico all over the world, great to have such a diverse group with us. Send it in the Q&A window on Zoom, type it into the chat window, have it sent to panelists or send it directly to me, and I will do my best as we go through the discussion to make it as inclusive a discussion as we can. Let me just give you a one minute overview of the book and then I will introduce Tanya and we will get into the discussion. For those of you who don't know it, Eat, Sleep, Innovate is the most recent book by the Innosite team. It's got four authors on it, three people from Innosite, me and my colleague, Andy Parker, who is a partner with me here in Singapore, Natalie Painshow, who's based in the US, who is our director of learning. And the fourth author is Paul Cobbin, the chief data and transformation officer at DBS Bank. The basic theme of the book is how do you build a culture where the behaviors that drive innovation success come naturally. In the book, we start by defining what those behaviors are. We talk about the fundamental challenge inside many organizations that innovation is doing something different and organizations are wired to do what they're currently doing better, faster, cheaper, more effectively, more efficiently. They get into grooves, they get into habits. So the book makes the case that you have to break that inertia and encourage new behaviors by ripping a page out of the habit change literature and introducing what we call beans, behavior enablers, artifacts, and nudges to encourage and reinforce behavior change at scale. And then in the book, we talk about how you can then support the planting of beans and creating a, a culture that really has innovation that sticks and scales through a set of systematic interventions so that any organization, for-profit, not-for-profit, big, small, et cetera, can be one where the behaviors that drive innovation success come naturally. And we start in chapter one with a couple of case studies from UNICEF, which might not be an obvious place to start, but UNICEF is a fascinating organization. Most of you probably know its mission, provide food and health care to children in war-stricken countries, 
12,000 people operating in more than 190 different countries, one of the most global organizations in the world. Tanya helped to run and expand the organization's first global innovation center. And Tanya, I, I want to start by talking about our origin story. So I, I remember the, the first time we met, I was doing a webinar with Harvard Business Publishing Corporate Learning for UNICEF. And I have kind of a standard thing I do in these webinars, which is I ask people, give me an example of innovation inside your organization. And I really push for kind of day-to-day, -day, everyday innovations. And often it's kind of like pulling teeth to get people to give examples. You got to really push and cajole. But at UNICEF, it was just these breathtaking examples, one after the other. And I said, wow, this is amazing. There's a ton of innovation going on inside UNICEF. So I'll tell everybody a little bit more about the role that you played in the organization, and then we'll get into some of the specifics. Sure. Um, so um, I think, you know, ex exactly as you said, it's a, an organization that benefits from an incredible footprint. Um, and our mission really spans so many areas of work. So whether it is looking at kind of new ways of learning or healthcare or protecting um, children and young people or delivering, you know, support to um, mothers with newborns, you know, water, sanitation. So, so the kind of breadth of geography, the breadth of areas we focus on is kind of almost a natural uh, sort of ecosystem where new ideas can kind of spring from. A lot of those, um, you know, are around connecting the dots. And I think that's really where my role and the kind of ideas that bubbled up um, and we kind of, we re remake our um, architecture around innovation on average. Now it's about every 24 months. Um, and so the piece that I really focused on in establishing and leading our global innovation center was to figure out how could we um, connect the dots together, uh, identify a few things from the literally sometimes thousands of things that are going on and take those things forward to sustainable scale. So something that starts with 10,000 people in one country, even one part of one country can eventually go to, you know, tens of millions of people uh, in 72 countries. Um, so that's kind of our, how do you make that happen? How do you, to use your beans analogy, how do you farm with ideas successfully? Uh, that's great. And it, it's amazing when you think about the innovation energy that comes from a dispersed organization like yours, because you're really at the front line. You've got people all around the world that are there working with the equivalent of the customer, in this case, the children whose mission it is for UNICEF to serve. So I'm going to ask you a, a question that's a really unfair one. I, I've got four kids here in Singapore. You asked me what my favorite is. You know, I love them all. I, you've seen a lot of innovations at UNICEF. Any, any one or ones that you would call your favorite? Um, yes. Uh, so I would say, so the ones that tend, but there's a char common characteristic about the ones that I call my favorites. Um, and they are all very much, um, um, you know, face to face engaged with young people. And it's really around us trying to open up opportunities and ecosystems and, and the confidence and capability in young people to be solvers, to be entrepreneurs, um, to really you know, solve the challenges that they see every day. Um, with that in mind, they're kind of the two that are my current favorites and they do shift around a little bit. So one of them is a program um, called Upshift, which you know, when we started this um, part of, you know, as Scott, as you described, there is an inertia in big organizations to kind of say, well, you know, we've been, we've been dealing with young people's engagement in a certain way, it's working well, why would we want to do something that looks so totally different? Um, and it looks like, um, you know, a program over three to six months where you're, you're, you know, working with the most marginalized young people, so either ethnically or, you know, economically, these are young people, adolescents who've dropped out of school um, and really have no, you know, what's their, what is their kind of um, future pathway. And you're taking these young people and designing something that looks like you've stuck um, a, a kind of startup boot camp from Silicon Valley into a blender and it's come out looking completely different because it's for a completely different context. How does that even scale? What difference is that going to make? Um, but we really believed very much in this because we fundamentally saw that the person going into that program and the person coming out was completely different um, and it has scaled. So in fact, what we have been able to do is take these incredibly powerful examples of young people you know, changing their future pathways, starting enterprises, um, and, and these have been adopted by governments and brought in, you know, going from one or two locations to entire national curricula. Um, and the one other one that I would point to that came out um, as a, almost like an entrepreneurial venture from people in our own offices 
um, in Lebanon who were delivering this program to tens of thousands of refugees, turned some of the methodology on themselves and today have launched um, a digital impact sourcing social venture um, that is you know, turning a profit that has been spun off into its own entity um, and that is kind of staffed and is being staffed by young people from the most marginalized kind of places. So to me, that is, you know, it's just this incredible exponential impact you can have from an idea of doing something in development very differently. Awesome. Well, I, if you saw me reaching over there, I was grabbing my copy of Eat, Sleep, Innovate, which I do have on my desk here. I, too, was very struck when I first heard Upshift enough so that if you get to about page, you don't have to get very far in the book, you have to get all the way to page 23 and you can read all about Upshift because we use it in the book to highlight the five behaviors that drive innovation success, curiosity, customer obsession, collaboration, being adept in ambiguity and being empowered. And the Upshift program, I think, shows that brilliantly. The collaborative one is the word I want to pick on for a second, because I think Upshift shows collaboration in two ways. One is the, the nature of having something like a startup boot camp. You're encouraging collaboration in communities and between communities. But it also shows the role of the GIC within UNICEF to collaborate and spread and scale ideas. So I think Upshift very easily could have been something that started and ended in the first country in which it operated, which I think was Kosovo, if I remember correctly, but it didn't. So how do things in this massively distributed organization, how do you spread? How do you scale ideas? Lots of organizations have that problem, but there are interesting things at the edges, but getting them to spread through the organization is really hard to do. So what do you do at UNICEF? It really is. And I think, um, you know, we are very mindful that um, this kind of innovation disease of having a pile up in the pipeline, many, many things, a kind of ideation, prototyping, proof of concept stage, lots of that done, very little scale. Um, for us, we're kind of obsessed at how innovation delivers impact and results at scale. So it's kind of this constant back and forth because um, there's naturally a lot of interest. It's much easier to do something small. It's much harder to actually take that thing and to grow it. Um, I think fundamentally there's also a little bit of something that's less sexy about saying, well, hey, you know, we're taking the solution to the 72nd country. It does look different. It's very context specific. But yeah, it's not it's not brand new, you know. So there's there is something about um, the incentives, and I think the key point, uh, one of the key points in the book around culture, is what are the incentives in any organization, in ours and yours, um, that will actually help incentivize people to value. Um, being able to scale something up to value um, if I have a choice of doing something as a one off or a choice of actually taking an idea and here are some of the key points um, taking an idea that I have heard about um, that you're communicating to me with enough evidence that you've put some effort in to make it easier for me to kind of remove you know, what are the roadblocks for me sitting in, in the next country in Jordan or Vietnam which were kind of the next countries that it moved to from Kosovo um, you know how, how does something an idea go from one place to another? How do I understand it as being relevant? And how do you make it as easy as possible for me to grab that um, and, and move it forward? And I think we really un took some time to understand and understand those incentives um, and also figure out, you know, communication, recognition, of course, financial support, um, but putting in place sometimes really simple process steps uh, that can help that adoption um, happen, that evidence, understanding who, do, who are you speaking to, who do I need to convince um, in order to make this a success, uh, and, and really a lot of it um, was thinking about that, um, you know, hopefully what we'll be, we'll also start to talk more about is so, so how are we trying to kind of move beyond just the team and kind of innovation um, and move to really um, you know, move those kind of 12, 19,000 people um, to be much more effective about doing this as a daily habit. Um, and I was thinking, actually, I think, um, Scott, when we originally met, a phrase that you and I both sort of just used on the spur of the moment in that webinar was, how do you make innovation kind of everyday innovation? So a, kind, a habit that doesn't mean that you need to have a title or for that to be some percentage of your work, but how does that become a daily habit in the culture of an organization? Great, so I, I, I wanna probe on that in just a second. I'm gonna comment first, you know, this notion, who wants to be the 72nd country who adopts something? This is one of the, the barriers you see inside many organizations. They think it only counts if you have something that's a breakthrough, that's new to the world, that no one has ever done before, et cetera. 
our definition of innovation in the book is very simple, something different that creates value. We consciously have the word different rather than new because you can smartly adapt something and that's totally fine. The creation of value is ultimately the important part. You're not getting scored based on your degree of difficulty. This is not Olympic figure skating or whatever. You're getting scored on whether you are measurably improving the lives of the children you're serving or if you're in a for-profit setting that you're generating revenues and profits and improve customer loyalty and all that. So there's no shame, no shame at all in brilliant borrowing, smart adaptation and so on. So Tanya, let's talk a little bit more about this idea of the, the 12,000 and how do you really enable and empower people at scale so you don't have to have a centralized innovation group to go and do it, but a centralized group can enable, can empower, mm -hmm. can really catalyze change in the organization. What, what have you learned within UNICEF? I think what we've learned are a couple of things and you know there's always this kind of culture each strategy for breakfast but we recognize that one of the things we did need to articulate was in fact a strategy so we've kind of worked on that piece at the same time um you know recognizing what is it about the culture um that that needs to be tweaked that would move it to being much more um a nurturing of innovation and you know one of the the pieces that we kind of talk about is is psychological space psychological safety what is our kind of risk appetite how do we understand risk where does that appetite come from um and the centralized component being how can we as an innovation function help others create that space in their teams. Um, you know, part of it is around kind of learning and development. So um, we're just about to share out sort of a, um, if you will, like a manager's toolkit. So if you're somebody who has influence over one or more people, that actually means that you can empower an entire um, environment that would be very enabling to help those one or 50, how many people are in your team to be able to try something different that does drive value. Um, and it's also around understanding how we can play with the incentives of, you know, uh, resources, um, uh, meaning actually, you know, actually financially being able to fund certain things that people are doing, which, which are, you know, things that we are, where value is clearly evidenced um, and we've kind of built out uh, now a, a platform that really makes it very clear where we actually ask you to to articulate what is the value difference that this is going to make um, you know to to a child to young people to the community in which they're trying to thrive in um, uh, you know so that it is really clear we're not looking at something to to be breakthrough it's not that it is just a new piece of technology that would be interesting to use the question um, we're trying to constantly refocus on is what is the problem um, that we're trying to solve that innovation can make a difference to the lives of children and young people. Uh, a, a comment and then I, I want to drill into this idea of psychological safety a little bit more. So the, the comment, what is interesting to me when I have the opportunity to have conversations like this is UNICEF is a very different context than working for a large for-profit organization or an entrepreneurial startup or a, a, a branch of a specific country government. It is a, its own unique setup, but the language you're using, the idea of how do we help, in your case, children, you could put in customers instead, how do we help them solve problems? How do we help them in the language we use? How do we help them address jobs to be done? How do we help them make progress with the things they're trying to do in lives? The innovation challenge, the innovation opportunity is the same. Uh, whether you're at a big, small, for-profit, not-for-profit, I think there's just a tremendous amount to learn from different people poking at the problem from different perspectives. So the thing I wanna drill into, and I, I will remind the group here, we've got about 25 minutes left. I've got plenty of questions. I can keep firing questions at, at Tanya during the rest of the time, but I, I would also love to hear any questions that you have. So. Feel free to type them into the chat window. Feel free to put them in the Q&A button on Zoom. And I will try to get some questions from the audience into the discussion as well. A psychological safety is something that you hear from more and more organizations. This idea that you need an environment where people feel like they can speak truth. People feel like they can take well thought out risks without the fear of having something bad happen if they don't pan out. It's not stupid risks, it's not that they're going and doing crazy things, it's that they can be safe enough that they can consciously try, push boundaries and have candid conversations without feeling like this is gonna happen. How do you do that in, inside UNICEF? How, how have you helped people in local organizations create that psychological safety? So I imagine in some country context, that's a really foreign concept. 
Yeah, I think, you know, and I think overall it's, um, it's uh, a piece of kind of a cultural shift that we are trying to make as an organization as well, because we obviously um, recognize that, that having um, that those sort of safe spaces and, um, you know, and having the ability to explore and question and discuss openly is, is great for all our work, I mean, including and especially sort of innovation. Um, so there are different, you know, ways, I think, that, that, that we're trying to tackle it. So there's no one, no one answer. Um, one of them was uh, the, 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 uh, the whole kind of series that you, Scott, were a part of when we first connected, which is taking a really key part of our leadership, our deputy representatives. Um, and I think it's kind of key that we spend some time identifying that for innovation, those roles are really key. The reason is that they're one role in the office. It's not, it's for, for reference, but it's the number two, if you will, kind of role. There are two number twos. So it's, it's, it's not the number one kind of, you know, country director. Um, it's not the representative. It's the person right below that. Um, and the reason why they're so key is they're actually operationally connecting to every single piece of kind of programmatic action that is happening. So um, being they're they're so essential in being able to set the tone from the top, if you will. So they're engaging with so many staff. Um, they're able to ask and therefore give credibility to the question of Have we thought of a different way of doing this? Um, you know, this looks like um, maybe more of the same, or we're just expanding out on something that we've been doing for a long while. Have we thought about you know Is there a, is there a different way of tackling this problem? Um, when they're kind of, uh, they, they can really do a lot about creating space by simply asking a whole series of questions that are non-threatening, um, you know, and non-critical, but they actually, by just by asking those and by kind of managing a process where we design our programs, create that opportunity to provide different answers, to go in different directions. Um, they're also really key in being able to um, be the ones who can give, uh, give a yes and to give a kind of management support to trying something different. Um, and then, then I think the piece comes into where does the central role of our Office of Innovation come in? And that's where we can bring sort of legitimacy, credibility, support, and whether that's expertise or otherwise to you know, the idea or to the effort of trying something different to experiment. Um, and then also the key piece is how do we learn from all of that? And how do we create a kind of a community um, that can find each other? So I think in an organization that is spread so far um, geographically and across so many areas, some of the common questions are, you know, how can we do better about, you know, finding out what other people are doing? How can we better connect them? Um, how do I better understand where my opportunity is in this innovation space, which by definition is a bit amorphous and it's, you know, it's the least sort of um, specific thing to put your finger on. Um, so I think there's a lot that we can, you know, do these key roles. Um, and then also just supporting with things like um, clear processes, clear structures, clear places to go to for help. Um, and part of this kind of um, portal that we're just about to launch in two weeks time is, is around making it really easy to find out, hey, what are other people doing? Where are they? Like, what is this about? What are they trying to um, solve problems for? And make that information really quickly accessible, totally open, easy to filter. Um, because in our experience of kind of the last four or five years, some of the most interesting work has been in being able to connect the dots that are three different groups in three different regions in three different sectors trying to solve what is fundamentally the same challenge and bringing those people together um, and that's sort of for us some of the really highest value work uh, that we can make things really happen because then you kind of have this um, really amplified um, exponential impact when you roll out sort of solutions that come from interdisciplinary work. Great. Well, there's, there's uh, some questions that have come in that I, I, I want to get to one of them in just a second, but I, I want to play back a couple of things that I heard in your answer because I think it's very interesting. This idea of focusing, over-indexing, not on the number one person, but one of the number twos in organizations is really interesting. I was with uh, the CEO of a, a large organization that is well known for having driven some big culture change over the course of the past decade or so. And what they were saying is the basic problem they have is, is their top leadership gets it, and the, the roots for the organization get it, it's the middle. The, the, the frozen middle is the big challenge. And when you're in a context where you can have someone who's a little bit closer to that middle, be able to go and thaw it, I think that's something that could really enable change. 
And then I was also struck by the technique that you, you said to give to the deputies, which is essentially have them ask good questions. It's something that we talk about in the book as being a real enabler of innovation when leaders role model asking what we call discovery questions, questions where there's no black or white answer to it, you have to go and open your mind, it leads to you thinking in innovative ways and so on. Things like, you know, what, what are some jobs to be done? What are experiments that we could run to learn more? What surprised you? Not things that will shut you down, like how do you know for sure that this is right? Because you never, you never know for sure that it's right. So the power of good questions is something that strikes me a lot too. So one of the questions that came in, talks a little bit about this idea that, that you mentioned a portal to help share knowledge. And this is from our good friend, Vince Tobias, who's based in the Philippines. So Vince, uh, 126 in the morning, so good job. But, but Vince has asked, how do you collect the pain points and problem statements from across the organization? So I, I get that there's soon to be a portal where they can be shared, but you gotta get them to get in the portal in the first place. So how do you overcome the problem that too many of those live in people's heads? Yes, um, and, and actually this is a, such a fantastic question um, because you know, what it forces us to, to balance between is what are the things that we want to globally focus on from a portfolio management? What is the kind of global UNICEF innovation portfolio? And the approach there is really very much through kind of um, data-driven program analysis and then also a bit of magic or not a yeah, bit of the arts and a lot of the science. Um, and so the process of kind of our global priority setting or what are our global problems that we want to talk about um, is where we really look at what are our problems. We, and, and UNICEF is, is incredible in being able to both ground truth, but also have um, a really sort of thoughtful data and evidence driven approach to figuring out an array of, of the major challenges. But then we put one of those layers on top of it, which is that's great, but which are the ones that we really do believe that innovation can make a difference in um, because of the, what the fundamentally the problem is and or because there is space to really move an area. So throwing out an example, something that we pivoted on was lots of problems around education, COVID-19 comes in, suddenly now you have lots of problems around education for some people who can't actually access education even, you know, which marginalize even more kids. So how, how does that look for kind of remote learning, um, you know, and, and other kind of digitized um, opportunities? And is that something that innovation can do something about? Absolutely. Um, there may be other uh, challenges that don't lend themselves very well to, you know, to innovation being the primary um, way of going forward. But those global challenges are not always the same ones you know everywhere and they differ from region to region so for example uh, in south asia um, uh, you know where we have a couple of callers from nutrition you know under nutrition sometimes over nutrition in the philippines these things coexist those are completely different and much more regionalized um, potentially uh, you know especially the under nutrition problems um, and and so our kind of approach makes space for understanding there's a globe there are global problems and priorities, but there are also sort of sub portfolios to this. So specific countries will have things that are very meaningful that they need to focus on and want to innovate on. Um, some of them may be across multiple countries in the same region, uh, but from our centralized sort of efforts, the ones that we're trying to really tackle and get behind are the ones that um, that we can scale and that have relevance across the, you know, the maximum number of, of, of countries or, or, you know, people. Great. Well, there's a question that has come in that comes from Ramahan Reddy, where the question is, apart from establishing innovation culture at a broad level, did you face problems with the culture in specific regions or specific countries that ran counter to what you were trying to do related to innovation? And if so, how did you, how did you manage it? I, I, there's a little bit of editorializing that I put into that question, but I, I think I got the spirit of the question. So, you know, how do you manage some of the, the local cultural changes or differences that might inhibit some of the things that you've talked about here? So I think we um, benefit from a number of things that are fundamental to the organization. So one is absolutely, we completely honor and have um, given a lot of time in all our work and that you know, therefore innovation benefits from into understanding the local context. Um, and so things like, you know, we, we have, for example, um, developed a, a really interesting app that girls themselves developed and Indonesia, Mongolia, those were some of the countries that were involved in designing this app around kind of managing their periods or their menstrual hygiene, which is 
a, in some places, a very taboo subject. People don't want to talk about it. It's not something you can talk about openly the same way you could in, you know, Europe or, or uh, many other countries in the world across, you know. So, so again, that kind of cultural piece plays into it. So one, we have a fundamentally for all our work already an understanding of what some of those issues could be. But um, number two, um, we also kind of in our own offices, in our work, have um, an incredible diversity. So, you know, you have a number of people always coming in and out of the office. I, I, you know, I think the culture in our offices, which I think is part of the, the question that was asked, is already a little bit sort of distinct and, and naturally invites, um, you know, people to engage. But then the third part is, you know, we're in this example, for example, we are working with an understanding of that context, we are creating the space for people who live in that context and, and have to, you know, and we're trying to sort of stretch that, that space for them to engage. In this case, girls who can't talk openly about this, but for whom it's really Im important for them to be able to go to school regularly, um, to be able to have a solution that works for them. So we create a space for them to be able to design something and they're, um, you know, that works. Um, and, and literally down to how what the visual design of that app looks like uh, is something that if you know your older brother or anybody else um, a grandmother or a you know parent were to look at that does not look like someone is tracking their you know tr is trying to find out you know do I need to be prepared when I go to school tomorrow because you know um, uh, I don't want to have to not go to school tomorrow so very very thoughtful design human centered design customer if you will led process. And one of the things, again, that I'm really struck by in terms of one of the advantages UNICEF has, you know, Linda Hill from the Harvard Business School wrote a book called Collective Genius a few years ago, co-authored with a former top executive from Pixar. And one of the things she makes in, one of the points she makes in the book is innovation is something different. You can't get to something different unless there's some, what she calls creative abrasion, where you, you get this little bit of tension where you are going to have diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of approaches. And there's going to be some tension there because it's not like everyone's going to see things in the same way. But if you can embrace that creative abrasion in a context that's psychologically safe, then you get some real diversity dividends because you're going to see things that no individual would see. How do you make sure that the creative abrasion doesn't lead to creative conflict and you get tribalism and different groups splitting apart because diversity can be a huge benefit when there's equity and inclusion and it cannot be when you have issues that stop people from getting that full diversity dividend right and you know i think we're sort of i don't think there's a magic bullet sort of answer to this i think we do benefit from the fact that it is a incredibly diverse organization anywhere so any office anywhere um, is going to is going to look different and then look incredibly diverse. Um, the next thing is sort of what expectations do we set up um, around kind of innovation in terms of being a space and an activity that um, that you know we are expecting something different. I think actually for for us sometimes the concern is that there's there's ideas that are like so different that they they tend to gravitate completely to the breakthrough um, side of things. Uh, you know that it, that it's almost like we are we are um, we're more we're more interested and more eager and more more curious and creative in, in that space than um, than actually sometimes looking at the incremental changes that can have massive impact because of the economies of scale. Small things done many times, um, but I think. I think it's sort of it is balancing those things and it's also very much in how do we communicate about it so I think that's an area where um, I think we can be doing much more internally in terms of um, you know supporting this kind of um, constant positive creative tensions uh, you know as, as you mentioned um, Scott um, but I think just because I think I think because a lot of what we do is always taking many diverse um, opinions and people and context into mind and a lot of work is done just normally about consensus people are quite skilled in in how to kind of navigate that um, but as I say that you know when I look at the spread of ideas and activities it is you know there are incremental things but there are you know things that some people would describe as wild and wacky and that kind of, you know but I think there's a when we can place a um, um, place a, a kind of a, a portfolio, an approach, a strategy, a reason for value behind those things. Um, you know, and I think fundamentally that's the piece that, that holds everyone together, no matter what the diversity of their views is, they would agree that if you can bring evidence that this is going to do no harm, that this is going to drive results better um, and actually help the people that we are all 100% aligned on helping, um, 
you know, it's kind of the, the same thing as the profit motive in a sense of being the one thing you can align a, a private sector organization against. That's the thing you can align and we are very much aligned around. Yeah, interesting. Well, I, I, I'm struck by your idea of providing bounds around the problem of saying it's not just about breakthroughs, but the day-to-day -day stuff done again and again and again can add huge value to things. And that, that connects me to one of the things that you said that every 24 months, the innovation capability within UNICEF seems to change. And I noted that one thing that you did this year is that you introduced an innovation ambition matrix, which sounds cool. Uh, what, what exactly is the innovation <laughs> ambition matrix? Well, um, so so we were, you know, we were looking at kind of around at what is the sort of best of breed thinking around portfolio management, because a lot um, of some of the challenges we have in trying to find and scale the things that 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 have great potential is literally finding them, putting them in a common framework that we can all kind of relate to them. Um, and uh, having looked at kind of uh, different models that are used by the private sector, public sector, you know, uh, etc. We we felt that the innovation ambition matrix, which basically is looking at what is the newness of a challenge that you're facing or a problem that you're trying to solve, and what is the newness of the solution, helped us really quickly and easily um, place solutions between something that is, you know, a known challenge and a known solution. That's something that's fairly, that's incremental, it's mature, we know a lot about it, it's low risk. Um, and that's where we would look to as an innovation function, centralized, that's when you're kind of exiting things into, this is the new way that we do business, because you really don't, like this is the area where we as a function would add the least value. But where you're looking at kind of a completely new challenge and a completely new solution, this may be, you know, strategically an area where we may lack the right kinds of expertise or sufficient experience, um, where we are still finding out more about the problem. Um, and those are really where we sort of would see things that are perceived as perhaps being higher risk because we don't know much about a solution we're going to try, but by positioning it in this kind of breakthrough space and acknowledging, yeah, these are ones that carry greater risk, but here's our you could almost experimental approach. This is what we plan to learn from this. And this is how we either will decide from having invested time and effort into trying something that either it doesn't have um, evidence to back it up moving forward, or in fact it does and we need to invest further and we need to try this in another place and build more, more evidence. Um, and then the place where these two meet kind of is, is really sort of what we call substantive um, innovation. So those are where we know we have some evidence and that's really the part that we're quite excited about because we believe that that is where you are able to do the process of moving from many things and many experiments that you're trying identifying those gems that are going to be able to, you know, with some more investment from a sort of more centralized role, move into dozens of countries and have that massive impact at scale, um, which is why we, we want uh, to innovate on our programmatic problems. Awesome. Well, you know, I, again, I, I, I'm really struck by the, the thoroughness by which UNICEF approaches this and some of the, the real advantages you have. I mean, of course, we know 12,000 people is going to come with bureaucracy. It's going to come with barriers. It's going to come with sometimes things taking too long. But when you have more of a, a growth mindset, and you say, well, what are the things we can do? What are the unique capabilities we have? One of the fun facts uh, Tony, that you taught me is that UNICEF is the largest purchaser of both pencils and, and vaccines, if I remember that correctly, in the world. That's right. It's kind of crazy until you say, well, yeah, actually, that makes a ton of sense that UNICEF would do those things. But, you know, I, I, I think the, the question that that then connects into is one of the questions that came from the audience here. And just checking time, we've got about seven minutes left, so we'll do two or three more questions and we'll, we'll call it a, a book club. So Deborah asked the question that she would love to hear examples of nudges you reference for behavior change. You know, so how do you encourage 12,000 people to do different things without kind of beating them over the head. And, and I'll give an example or two that's in the book just to give you time to think about what kind of nudges that you've used in UNICEF. So, you know, in the, in the book, one of the beans that we talk about is this idea of the mojo bean within DBS. I won't bore people with all the detail. If you've been on prior section, sessions, you know what it is. You can go look at it, a bunch of stuff to see it. But it's basically a way to get people to improve the behavior they follow at meetings, to make meetings more effective, to make them more collaborative, and so on. One of the nudges that is tied to the mojo bean is the MO, the meeting owner who's responsible for organizing meetings. They get an update every month that shows the ratings they receive from people sitting in meetings. This is basic gamification, basic leaderboard ideas, because if you get something like that, you say, oh, I'm number 10 on the list and I just want to get that much higher. 
So that can be a very powerful nudge to encourage new behavior. Another thing that we see a lot of people do is use vis visual cues. I mean, obviously this doesn't work too well in a digitally dislocated world, but in worlds where people are in offices, a number of organizations put big pictures of the customers they're trying to target on the wall. It's just a very subtle way to remind people to be customer centric, to be customer obsessed in what they do. Playing with physical architecture to encourage people following new behaviors, visual reminders, gamification principles. These are all ways to help to very quietly get the unconscious to drive some of the change that you're seeking. And I wonder, Tanya, after I, I bought you a couple of minutes with some of those examples, if there's anything you can think of at, uh, at Unison. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, and actually think um, our discussion often, you know, with, you refer to it as kind of the frozen middle. I'm not sure that we have a frozen middle, but I'd say that they're, they're um, importantly, you know, they're really important kind of in our organization. Um, our asks are, you know, for exactly those sorts of things. What is a really simple thing that I could do? You know, not a big ask for me, not a big investment that you're asking me to make that's, that could help my team, that could help bring, you know, more innovation into our space. And it could be, you know, we talk about this could be simply like, you know, is this uh, is this some is it a question is it kind of a series of questions i ask is it space in a routine kind of um, meeting where you know my team gets together that we build in something which is either very much focused kind of on work where we ask hey what's what's one thing that you read or heard about this week um that you know made you think differently uh about you know about about something that we do that would be that was a very different take on it which is kind of you know Trying to trying to get to a little bit of an aha space. Um, is this uh, you know are there sort of more generic questions that if I stick on an agenda um, with my with my team or in a meeting speaking about meetings um, that can you know can can actually prompt people to stop from just going on in in kind of the the normal expected way of thinking about um, various topics and actually cause everyone to halt and sort of say, okay, well, wait a minute, that's, you know, what is the, what are the one or two, what is the question I could throw out there or actually have um, that, that stops us from just uh, going on with our momentum um, and causes us to pause and, you know, ask ourselves to think about something or force us to think about it in 180 different, you know, degrees differently. Um, I do, you know, we're, we're also, you know, really aware that in, a, in the way of kind of nudging, just small things like small points of recognition are really important, especially when people are so dispersed. Um, it is really difficult to kind of feel like, you know, your efforts and your ideas are seen, recognized and appreciated. To think much more of using our internal kind of social channels and sort of saying, hey, you know, props to whoever who did this or thanks to so-and-so who shared a really interesting article or, you know, encouraging people to share that article um, and just get, you know, those, those little interpersonal components that together, you know, all eventually end up being a bit of a, a bigger nudge, collective nudge on, on culture. And then of course, recognition can really go um, much, much further. And I think um, for us, it's, it is a, a significant incentive um, and, you know, internal incentive. All right, we have just a couple minutes left, so I'm going to go to lightning round, which is I'm going to ask you a few questions, just looking for brief answers to each of them. So first question, when we had our, our conversation about innovation at UNICEF about 16 months ago now, uh, you told me the proverb that I, I, I see you have tied to your own personal belief that you can go fast alone, but you can go far together. Three words, three words to describe the mindset you need to do innovation work at UNICEF. What three words would you choose? Collaborative, low ego. Collaborative, low ego. That's great. Collaborative and low ego. Second question, COVID-19 for UNICEF, is it an opportunity? Is it a challenge? Which one? Every challenge, every challenge is an opportunity. So absolutely, it's an opportunity. And, and it depends on us being agile enough to pivot to that. Outstanding. And, and would you trade your role to work in a big, large for-profit organization? You know, I, I've often wondered about that, and you know, uh, had outreach from from you know organizations with with uh, with offers. And I think for me, the the I wake up every day firmly believing um, that whatever effort I put in is actually a little tiny contribution to. I know it sounds cliched, making the world a better place. But when I look at what you know people around me are doing, I can never question that 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 isn't true. Um, so I think that that 
little piece, uh, you know, every day is incredibly um, resonant and would be, you know, would be difficult to equal, but not impossible to equal because there are a lot of private sector companies in which you can actually say precisely the same thing. Right. So I'm going to ask one last question that, that would be advice that you would give to people like you, because the people who are joining this book club, the people who are reading the book are all people, presumably, who are trying to drive innovation inside established organizations. So I would love to hear the advice that you wish that you had a few years ago as you went on your own journey. Before that, I'll just summarize a few of the things that I've heard from this conversation. The idea of good questions, I've heard that come up a bunch of times as a way to create psychological safety, to encourage innovation behaviors. I was really struck by this idea of focusing consciously on the number two in an organization as a way to unthaw the organization and create the space for innovation. I am once again awestruck by the collaboration that you can potentially drive at UNICEF, where truly none of us is as smart as all of us and connecting the dots across a large dispersed organization, some of which is just having your eyes on the ground, some of which is building informal mechanisms, some of which is reinforcing that by creating things like the portal that you talked about. And then the final thing that I, I reflect on in this conversation is just the comprehensiveness of what you talk about. Like any organization that is doing this with a degree of seriousness, this is not a program, this is not a slogan, this is not a one-off campaign. It is a movement that is done thoughtfully and is done thoroughly. And, you know, of course, has lots of room to improve. It has room to improve everywhere. But I, I think has helped to make a lot of people's lives a lot better. And I, I find very inspiring. So with all of that, Tanya, you, you, get, uh, you get next to last word. I'll close by saying goodbye to everyone. But advice you would give to the younger you? Um, I think advice I'd give to the younger you and the, the many of, of me's um, are, you know, around there is that sometimes you do feel like you're alone in this journey, but that's simply not true. Um, you just haven't found you know, your fellow travelers. Um, and it is difficult. And if it wasn't difficult, it wouldn't be worth doing. But I do think you know, that, that sometimes we feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm sure they don't have these problems in the private sector. They do. You know, oh, I'm sure that, you know, my colleagues over in XYZ organization and, you know, don't have these. They do. You know, and I think we just have to be um, willing to be, you know, to, to open up and exactly to your point, Scott, you know, thinking through things together and being able to have empathy and being able to like learn from each other. And I think really have very low ego and understand, you know, understand and appreciate, appreciate and open up that door. Um, just you know will will be faster a faster way of finding um everyone else who's on this same journey um you know and it's much more rewarding to travel it together fantastic and, and tanya i absolutely share that observation I've, I've had the great opportunity to work with people in all sorts of organizations and people always think that their organization is really unique and their challenges are really unique and yeah of course there's some degree to which that's true but the challenges and opportunities of innovation are really the same broadly, no matter what type of organization you're in. Well, this is uh, Tanya Coney, the, the second guest in the Eat Sleep Innovate Virtual Book Club. Tanya, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, and it was thanks for the great questions and, and interaction from everyone. All right, everybody, take care. Be safe, stay sane.